I'm Caroline Hyde, back in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, tech versus the travel ban, the rematch. The president has revised his original executive order restricting immigration. How is Silicon Valley reacting? Plus, the future of H-1B. The Trump administration slams the brakes on one of tech's most critical visa programs for fast-tracking overseas talent. And Snap sinks. We'll look into whether the IPO honeymoon could already be over. But first, to our lead. President Trump takes a second crack at his controversial travel ban. The new executive order replaces the original and restricts entry into the US for people from six predominantly Muslim countries. Iraq was removed from the first list and the language was amended to make clear that visa and green card holders and dual citizens will not be denied entry. Those were many of the points that the tech industry took issue with the first time around. So will we still see the same kind of opposition this time? Well, at least one CEO is speaking out again. Airbnb's Brian Chesky has already tweeted that barring people from entering our country because of where they're from was wrong the first time around, still wrong. Joining us now for more on what happens next, I'm pleased to say Bill Danvers, senior fellow from the Center of American Progress, is joining us. He's worked on national security for more than 30 years and has served under former CIA director Leon Panetta. Thank you, Bill, for joining us today. And legal challenges, can there be any this time? Well, there certain, certainly can always be legal challenges. That's why we have so many lawyers. Um, but <laughs> uh, I, I think they've tried to uh, eliminate as many as they possibly can. Uh, but I, I am also certain that there will be a, a hard look at uh, whether or not uh, this, this executive order can stand. Um, people from Silicon Valley, but, but, but people from, uh, from elsewhere in the country who are very concerned that this ban is not good policy. Not good policy. What do you think some of the key arguments will be here? Because, as we see, there has been now a, a, allowed in those with visas, with green cards. What sort of key arguments do you think they could display? Well, I think the key argument that you can display is why are we doing this? DHS uh, put out, a, or there was a leaked memo from DHS saying that uh, focusing on uh, where a, a person is from, a person's citizenship, is really no yeah. indication of, of whether or not they're going to be uh, a terrorist. And there's an indication that this really will do absolutely nothing to, uh, to deter terrorism. And I think that was the whole purpose of, of, of the exercise of the EO. Um, in addition, um, the, uh, the fact that, um, that he's made some of these changes changes really uh, don't, doesn't make a big difference um, in terms of uh, counterterrorism policy, and that's, that's what this is ultimately all about. They say that when people come from a particular country, um, it takes a couple of years of them being here already as, as legal residents to, uh, to uh, become radicalized. And also, it could be driving even more upset and distaste from around the world. I mean, already we are seeing a number of EU countries saying perhaps they're going to shut down the Schengen Agreement, stop US citizens being able to travel freely through the EU. I mean, that is just an initial illegal argument at the moment. It hasn't been put forward. But is this something you were expecting, retaliation worldwide? I don't know that there'll be direct retaliation, but, but it certainly sets for, it's, it's, it's bad policy. I mean, we need to, there are, I think, 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. Um, the terrorist threat uh, is something that, 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 it, that affects all of us, including the 1.6, or most of the 1.6 billion Muslims. Um, and we need to work with Muslim communities in this country and abroad if we want to counter this threat. Um, antagonizing uh, Muslims is, is really not a good policy. Getting to the heart of it, particularly from Silicon Valley's point of view, from tech companies, wherever they might be in the United States with you in Washington, could this new executive order make it harder to lure in talent? I think any time you put uh, roadblocks into talented people coming into the country, um, uh, you are risking the fact that they won't want to come here, that they will want to go elsewhere, and that we will lose a good pool of talent to help uh, our country uh, continue to be great. Do you have any expectation of where we might start hearing the legal challenges from first? Uh, tonight. <laughs> I tonight think be, from... And, yeah, well, I, I'm being a bit facetious. I think, <laughs> I think there will be a, a careful examination. I think there's been an expectation that the EO was going to look um, like, it, like uh, the one that was presented. In fact, I think the White House telegraphed that it wouldn't be changed all that much, um, and uh, at least in terms of the, the gist of it. And I think that, that, that lawyers have been poring over this. Uh, I guess the, uh, the Attorney General from the State of Washington uh, and the Solicitor General from the State of Washington, I'm sure they're looking at it right now and, and, and uh, considering that. Next steps, as I'm sure other attorneys general uh, are as well.
We brace ourselves for the next few hours. Bill Danvers, Senior Fellow at Centre for American Progress. Stay with us because just changing our focus to perhaps another story that this very think tank is at the centre of in terms of controversy. It's one of at least a dozen progressive groups allegedly targeted by Russian hackers in a new wave of attacks since the US presidential election. Now this is according to two people familiar with the investigations. The hackers are looking for embarrassing information from those groups and trying to extort hush money. All of this was broken by Bloomberg news cybersecurity reporter Michael Riley Fanta fascinating story that you put to us and from uh, can you give us really the extent of your views in terms of the groups that they're asking the sort of money they're asking for 30 to 150 thousand dollars attribution is very difficult but where do we think these attacks are exactly stemming from yeah, no, I mean, this is a, it's an interesting phenomenon because I think one of the questions after the 2016 presidential election was, are Russian hackers going to continue uh, on some level to meddle in the U.S. political system? I'm not sure that this campaign gives a full answer to that, but it may give some partial clues. It seems like there, there are at this point at least a dozen groups that have been hit uh, by hackers from Russia, that was, whose digital fingerprints indicate they're from Russia. Um, they've had emails stolen, they've had documents stolen, and they, the hackers have gone through these and looked for sensitive or embarrassing information, in many cases sent back examples of that with a ransom demand. As you point out, the ransoms are high. They're, they're from about 30,000 to about 150,000. Um, but uh, they could also just be taking a page out of the 2016 presidential election where you saw that political political groups have a lot to lose by having internal communications exposed in some cases and so it's it's possible that that this might have some element to uh, to it to, to state sponsorship to it but probably more likely is that this could just be a shakedown criminal hackers looking at this as a possibility to make some money I want to bring back in Bill Danvers from the Center for American Progress because it is alleged in the story that indeed your your institution was indeed hacked now the company your Center for American Progress has said, no, we weren't. We've got a statement from that particular business. But I want to get your take as an ex-member of the CIA, of State Department, you work with the Department of Defense. How concerning is it from a national security perspective, these sorts of hacks continuing from Russia? Well, I mean, obviously I stand uh, by, behind uh, Cap's statement. I, I think hacking is an issue. Hacking is, 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 is clearly an issue. Uh, DNI Clapper has... Uh, be uh, ex DNI Clapper, I guess now mentioned it in the annual threat assessment uh, uh, that he gives to Congress every year for the last few years. Um, it's it's a concern. Um, the good news is that uh, we've got no evidence we've, that we've been hacked. We've really no knowledge of it, and no reason to believe it's true. And Cap has never been subject to ransom, so that's the good news for for, for Cap at the moment. And but but I think going forward, we we need to be careful about these things. And and I'm glad that we've got uh, the intelligence community uh, focusing on it. Mike, your story is a fascinating read, and I want to just ask you, from a technology perspective, we are, of course, a tech show, then where are they finding the weak points? Because you actually mentioned a particular app, that's a Microsoft one, being used, the SharePoint. So is it that the sharing of documents that seems to allow the ha these hackers in? Uh, well, because uh, in increasingly technology is uh, a, an integrated part of our lives. We're more mobile with it. We use it to share uh, information and communications in all sorts of levels, not just through sort of emails, but also through all sorts of apps that, that are designed to make sharing easier and collaboration easier. This turns out to be kind of a bonanza for hackers. In this case, the hackers um, that uh, were part of this campaign have, uh, have basically found that you can use things like SharePoint, which is a, a system that allows, it's a sharing, web-based sharing app that allows mm -hmm. uh, sharing of documents that hooks into Microsoft Office as one way to sort of harvest documents. If you can get the credentials of one person who has access to, to, to that, it's a, a sort of a, 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 a version of sharing software, then it can, uh, it pr can present a lot of access to a lot of documents. You saw this in the, fall and summer when the Soros foundations uh, or the, the foundations associated with Soros philanthropies um, had there as a system that was designed to share among a lot of recipients of grants and grant people who, who are proposing grants and the staff all the, all the hackers had to do and these in fact were Russian state based hackers was get one set of credentials to that system and they were able to harvest a yeah. huge amount of documents. Mm. And wake up call for many, and I'm sure yet even more focus on cybersecurity going forward. Bloomberg News reporter Mike Riley, great story on the Bloomberg and online. And Bill Danvers, fascinating analysis across all our viewpoints from Center of American Progress. Thank you.
Now, one stop we're watching, and it has to be Snap, because it appears some of the initial shine is wearing off of this stock. After surging more than 50% after its first two days of trading last week, shares fell 12% Monday. That's as analysts begin weighing in on Snapchat parent company's true valuation. Check in on my Bloomberg. I've got the function, if you've got it ready, ANR, analyst recommendations. Five now of the seven analysts who cover this company have a sell rating. Two are neutral, it's got to be said. Aegis and Sakana are both neutral, but seven and not one single buy recommendation. Now coming up, we speak to a leader in China's booming peer-to-peer -peer lending space, China Rapid Finance. How the company will fare amid hefty regulations, that's next, and this is Bloomberg. The peer-to-peer -peer lending industry is heating up globally. China Rapid Finance wants in on the action and is said to be assessing an initial public offering in the US where it could raise at least $100 million. This comes as regulators in China tighten scrutiny over the industry, imposing limits on lending by peer-to-peer -peer platforms to individuals and companies after defaults and fraud ran rampant among the nation's online lenders. So how is the company adapting to the regulation and how is it looking to expand? Joining us now from New York is China Rapid Finance founder and CEO Zane Wang. Thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Phenomenal. 10 million loans that you've already put out, largest consumer lending marketplace serving China's emerging middle class. This could be something that was really rather appetizing for the investor base here. You've seen how Snap has gone. Is now the perfect time to IPO? Um, China Rapid Finance actually has tried to work with our the regulators and also try to develop our strategy to serve a huge untapped market in China. Uh, there are about 500 million people who do not have uh, credit access, but they do have a quality employment records, do have a quality jobs. So China Rapid Finance really tried to leverage our uh, superior technology, find a way to serve this uh, huge untapped market. But therefore, you've already made some success by the amount of loans you put out. We've said that you might be eyeing a public market debut in the United States this year. Could we see it come this year? China Rapid Finance, as a startup company, really we're looking for all possibilities to okay. uh, fund our operation. So we don't rule out any kind of possibilities. But at this moment, we actually focus our efforts to develop our strategy to serve this huge untapped market because this market right now presents probably the one of the largest untapped market uh, yeah. in the world. Talk to us about, therefore, if you did raise money in whatever form, how are you developing that strategy? What is it that you're pushing forward? Is it just regional expansion? Is it developing the technology, some of the, the AI and the machine learning you've brought on board? Uh, yeah, actually, not like in the U.S. market, where the consumer lending pretty much based on so-called credit bureau information, using credit information to assess people's willingness to pay, capability to pay, and stability. In China, we are operating in a space not covered by banks. Uh, this population, actually, they have a quality employment records and the good jobs. So we are using the data available in the internet space, mobile space, such that we can form a prediction set using uh, the so-called predictive, predictive selection technology to find uh, good borrowers. Potentially, they, we can help them to get started on our platform and build up the credit history. So we provide so-called affordable credit for the large the uh, amount of those people who do not have a credit access. So the yeah, technology I mean, is the key. You've, you've been doing some also fascinating work in terms of making sure you've got some novel ways of ensuring they are as credit worthy as you think, perhaps counting toothbrushes in houses, I, I even read. But talk to us about the regulatory environment, because there has been a pushback from the Chinese government. Is this something that is making your life, your business more difficult to grow? Is this something that actually eases some of the pressure in the competition? Um, actually, you're right. Actually, regulators really try to help this sector to grow in the form of the, uh, the protected uh, lenders and also protected uh, borrowers. So we are working very closely with regulators, try to develop a strategy can help vast majority of the borrowers perform them, the, uh, provide them affordable 
uh, access to credit. On the other hand, we also was work with the regulators to provide uh, good access to the investment opportunities for qualified investors. So working with uh, both ends and working with the regulators. Yeah, well, maybe, just maybe, we might see you list in 2017 here in the United States. But whatever happens, you're developing that strategy. China Rapid Finance founder and CEO Zane Wang, thank you very much for joining us live from New York. Now, coming up, an analyst is betting on rapid growth in Amazon's grocery business. We'll hear from him on his new report. That's next. And, of course, I do want to draw your attention to a new feature that we have on the Bloomberg Interactive TV function. You can find it at TV Go. You'll not only be able to watch us live, but also see previous interviews and dive into any of the securities or Bloomberg functions we talk about. And you can become part of the conversation by sending us instant messages during our shows. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only, though, I'm afraid. Check it out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. stock to watch GoPro shares of the camera and drone maker tumbled to a record low in Monday trading that's after Goldman Sachs became the second firm in two days to recommend selling the stock in an the analyst note Goldman cited market saturation in the company's core action market and an inability to attract a more mainstream audience GoPro shares fell to less than eight dollars a share on Monday the company sold shares for twenty four dollars a piece in its 2014 IPO Maybe not always great to be a camera company, hey? Amazon's bet on its grocery business should pay off. That's according to research from Cohen and Company. Amazon's growth in food delivery will allow the e-commerce giant to go from the ninth largest U.S. grocery retailer this to the third largest by 2021. Joining us from New York is John Blackledge, Senior Equity Research Analyst and Managing Director at Cohen & Co. A great read if you're digging into your analysis. I'm a Brit. I'm going to put it out there. I love my online grocery shopping. We do it all the time. There's a Cardo. I've even done Amazon Fresh in the United Kingdom. I've done it here in the US as well. Is it, I'm surprised how li little dominance, actually, online grocery shopping has in the United States. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a great point. I mean, um, in the U.S., it's a trillion three market, one point three trillion dollar market retail. It's only like six percent online. If that's the food and beverage is about eight hundred billion and then consumables, which is like personal care and household goods, is like four hundred fifty billion. But yeah, it's only about six percent penetrated online right now. And what we saw in, in the U.K. is actually a great example of like we think adoption is going to continue to to go up. And in the U.S., Last year, about 12% of U.S. consumers bought grocery online. But interestingly, 20% of adults, 25 to 34, bought grocery online. So, you know, when you draw the line out over, over 15 to 20 years, that older millennial cohort, we think, will drive online grocery in the U.S. And in new proprietary data that we have in the U.K., in January of 2017, 34% uh, of UK consumers bought grocery online and another yeah. third said that they were likely to. So it's like it's it's three X the adoption of the US. And I, but I actually think that bodes well for for US adoption. The UK is just well ahead. And of course, in John, in the UK, it's the likes of Tesco that dominate. Then there's the other supermarket chains and then comes Amazon. How much of the piece of the pie will Amazon eventually own here in the United States? Yeah, so yeah, your, your lead in was exactly right. So we think it's the number nine uh, player right now uh, in, in kind of uh, overall in grocery. And we think it'll be number three by, by 2021. And the, the reason is they're attacking it in multiple different ways. Uh, number one is through Prime. So there's 50 million Prime households in the US. Then Prime Now, which is their one to two hour delivery service. Then Amazon Fresh, which is their end-to-end -end online grocery solution, in addition to Pantry and the Dash and the Dash button, and then they're also going physical with their uh, Amazon Go store, which is yeah. in beta, kind of in in Seattle right now. And then they're also going to be doing grocery pickup. So one thing that we noticed uh, last year. Amazon's overall global fulfillment grew 33%. But if you notice, um, grocery, uh, some of these platforms that I just mentioned, we saw accelerating growth. What I mean by that, uh, Amazon Fresh uh, added 10 markets. They're now they're at 20 at the end of, of 2016. They started 2016 with 10 total markets in the U.S. So that was a pretty big acceleration. And then Prime Now, uh, in 29 markets in the U.S., 
Um, it covers about 58% of U U.S. GDP, and uh, we think about 5 million prime households uh, bought goods uh, on Prime Now in any given month last year. And the, the biggest selling items on Prime Now are groceries, uh, personal care products, and household goods. So they're attacking yeah. it multiple different ways, which they, you know, they should because it's just so big. Very quickly, John, who'll lose out? Is it Walmart? Who will lose out? Um, yeah, who will be? We, yeah, so, uh, so Walmart's number one right now. We think they're going to be number one in five years. They have a huge, huge lead. Um, we just think Amazon will consolidate the space like they're doing in a lot of other verticals. Um, but, yeah, there's definitely a share shift going on. It's partially consolidation and partially, you know, some of the leading players will, will give share. John Blackledge, always great to get your opinion and your analysis. Managing Director and Senior Equities Research Analyst, thank you for joining us. Coming up, President Trump's la latest executive order puts the brakes on H-1B visas. What this means to Silicon Valley attracting top tech talent. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio, why don't you? You can now listen on Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the US on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde. And our top story this hour, President Trump's new executive order on travel. And the order will restrict entry into the U.S. by people from six predominantly Muslim countries. Iraq is no longer on the list, and Syrian refugees will now be treated the same as other refugees, rather than excluded. The announcement is more onerous, though, in certain areas, with the suspension of the 15-day premium processing program to fast-track applicants of H-1B visas, a process the Silicon Valley tech firms use to find the best and brightest talent. Joining us from New York is Michael Solomon, founder of 10X Management, a recruitment firm that hires for the likes of Google, the likes of eBay. Great to have you with us again, Michael. And just how important is this, is this particular area, the 15-day fast-track process for H-1B visas, how widely is it used? It's pretty, it's pretty broadly used, and I believe what we're really looking for right now is the beginning of a dismantling of this program, and I mm. think that that's going to really work very counter to the administration's goals, which is unfortunate. Yeah, we discussed the H-1B visa the last time that you joined this program, and we knew that there are some key issues at the heart of it. Sometimes it is being misused by certain companies. How could it be improved rather than dismantled, as you're, some, as you're at the moment worried about? I, I believe one of the things that we talked about the last time I was here is the idea that we can increase the threshold for hiring. So rather than a $60,000 minimum, move that yeah. to $120,000. The companies who need to bring in foreign talent because they can't get people here can easily afford to pay twice what they're paying now. They can afford to pay much higher expedited fees. That's good for the government. That's good for the economy. It will not take away jobs from people here because if people here are qualified for those jobs at lower prices, they'll take them. And the, the problem with what's being proposed now is, is as you reduce the number of tech talent that come in, all you're going to do is increase the pricing for those who are here. It's not going to create a whole lot of new jobs. How have some of your clients been reacting to this? Have they been trying to find talent ahead of the, any sort of cutback? I mean, we know that it starts at the beginning of April when they're allowed their new allotment of the amount of people coming in on H-1B visas, but how are they trying to maneuver? I think everybody's, everybody's sort of frozen right now. We've seen the beginning of this administration make a lot of very bold moves and then retracting from them. And I believe what we're observing right now is everybody trying to understand what the changes are, how quickly they're going to roll out, and how it's going to impact them. And this, the, the announcements that, sh that have just been made are being digested as we speak, and I think we'll see what the tactics are. The truth is, for a lot of companies that were relying on those expedited visas, they're going to have a very serious shortfall, and they're going to have to deal with the fact that they're going to have to find local talent and it may not be the right talent for a period of time or what may be worse is they may move those roles to offshore completely in which case yeah. we're, we're all losing out. Are you already starting to see that or hear that being voiced by clients? There, I mean it, it's sort of a simple equation when you have a job that needs to get done and you can't find people here to do it and you can't bring people here to do it you're gonna go get it done somewhere else. And Where are the most likely areas, do you think? Those talk of Canada, which countries do you think are being looked at and eyed up the most? 
I mean, I think that, you know, India sort of comes to mind first because they have a very large population of educated people. But I hear, especially as you look in the data science realm and the machine learning, more about Eastern Europe um, and, and um, Russia in, in particular, but uh, there's other places in Eastern Europe that have large swaths of tech talent. And we're going to just see these, these jobs and, and the, tax, the, the tax base going other places because somebody's got to do the, do the work. Have you seen openings piling up? Is the talent crunch already upon us? You said that at the moment we've sort of got a freeze going on, but uh, are you already seeing it being demonstrated? I mean, I, I believe the talent crunch has existed for years and is going to continue to exist for years. I, I haven't seen something happen in the last few months that makes it much worse, but I do think we're going to see, as, as this policy, as the effects of this policy uh, come into play, we're going to see rising prices. That's the first thing we're going to see, is, is companies are going to pay more for jobs that they were paying less for pr prior. Cost base going higher. Michael Solomon, do you stick with us? Because another story that we're watching, amidst falling morale, Uber employees are starting to explore exits from the company. Now, that's according to a report by the Financial Times. Last week, two executives resigned from the ride-hailing app, and the company continues to draw scrutiny of its every move. How does being under such a microscope impact employees? Michael Solomon, let's bring you back, founder of 10X Management. I want your take on this, because is there an Uber exodus going on at the moment? Are you seeing a pool of talent potentially coming from that business? I think we're going to see some big changes as a result of what's going on at Uber. There, there's a couple of things that you have to note. When a company has a misstep, everybody can be forgiving, everybody can acknowledge that, that all companies and, and management make mistakes. When you have a second misstep, there are more people who start to question, was this a one-time anomaly? Is this, is this a trend? Is this really a failing of management? And then when you have a third and a fourth misstep all within a two-week period, you're going to see fallout from that. You're going to see people leaving. You're going to see uh, you know, lots of discussion about management and culture changes. And you're going to see people ready to go, because uh, there, there's no shortage of jobs for these people. Does it still look like a good place to have worked, do you think? Is it putting people off applying for jobs there? And indeed, when people are leaving, do they want to brag that they were there? Um, funny you should ask that. Uh, we have a returning client to us who has Uber in his experience uh, in, in, as somebody who's done work for in the past. And we had a very long discussion about whether that's something we should list right now. Um, I will say that when we started the discussion wow. two weeks ago, it was an absolute yes, with, with me saying very clearly, this is a big, strong company, and the fact that you've done work for them is a good thing, and no one's going to hold you responsible for uh, mistakes that management made. But as the f stories of the last two weeks have continued to unfold, and it seems like foible after foible, you start to question that. I still think it's worthwhile to list it as a company. It's an amazing platform. It's an amazing piece of technology. If you help build that technology, I hope you're yeah. proud of it. But from a cultural standpoint and from a management standpoint, I think that's a, that's a, hard, that's a hard line to walk. That's utterly fascinating that perhaps it's less, and less of a bragging right now. But what about the lack of IPO? You mentioned it's the scandal, the first, the second, third, fourth, it goes on. But is it the fact that also there's potentially no end in sight to making your bucks from the IPO? Could that be something that's perhaps disenfranchising the employee base? Yeah, I think you have two things with, that you have to look at with that. Sure, people are holding out hope for an IPO and management has has said very recently they're hoping to hold it off for as long as possible and I'm sure this week even more more than ever they want to push it mm. into far into the distance but the other thing you've got away is the employees if they choose to leave pre IPO have you know those who have earned significant equity have significant financial consideration uh, you know if they're going to leave they're often required to buy their out to exercise their yeah. options which can be very expensive and make that choice a very difficult one Michael Solomon, as ever, great to get your viewpoints and analysis expertise. Founder of 10X Management, thank you for your time. And a story we're watching, French citizens living abroad will not be able to vote online in the upcoming legislative elections this June. The government said ballots will only be allowed to be cast in person due to, quote, the extremely high level threat of cyber attacks. This is a separate vote from the upcoming presidential election in France, for which internet voting was never allowed.
Coming up, the Samsung scandal continues. JY Lee allegedly conspired to create fake documents. All the details ahead. This is Bloomberg. South Korea's special prosecutor says the Samsung scandal continues to reveal, quote, chronic corruption. This time, the prosecutor accuses the company's de facto leader, J.Y. Lee, and another Samsung executives of conspiring to create fake documents, masking millions of dollars in bribes. Those payoffs allegedly went to a confidant of South Korean President Park Geun-hye. Lee has been in jail since his arrest last month, and the company rejects the accusations. Joining us now from Hong Kong, Bloomberg Gadfly's Tim Culpin has just been across this story. Tim, now it's interesting. How much is this starting to affect the business? I'm reading that they're dismantling the corporate strategy unit, which is perhaps part of where the corruption probe has been investigating. That's where the executive stemmed from. Yeah, you know what, Caroline, I think that could be one of the most significant changes that's coming out of this whole scandal and saga because one thing that's really made Samsung strong, and for many chaebols in Korea, is this central planning office that they have that you mentioned, uh, where basically high-level decisions can be made on the future of the company, where they should be in the next three, five, ten years, how to allocate resources, where to invest funds, how to raise money or whether to raise money in debt or equity or so forth. And so what happens is you can have that central planning authority in a company and they can decide look we know that we need to double down on chips so we're going to invest more money in chips and we're going to maybe scale back on say LCDs or or smartphones or, or rice cookers or whatever else and when you really divide the company down to its component parts a chip division a smartphone division a household appliances division then the individual CEOs of those divisions they of course want to expand and, and really boost their own businesses so when you take out that central planning organization you really can possibly lose that long-term strategic view for the company and I really think that's yeah. going to be a very very big risk to Samsung in the long term. But Tim what's so fascinating I'm looking at my Bloomberg the screen right now showing me that Samsung electronic shares are at all-time highs we're just we're continuing to see that rally are investors not really reacting at the moment to the concern about corporate strategy? It's yeah, it's, it is amazing, you know. Um, we think of all the things that's happened at Samsung, apart from this, of course, we had the, the battery crisis last year and even the washing machine uh, problems as well. Samsung's uh, shareholders are just shrugging it off. It is really quite amazing. They don't seem to care that much. Maybe they don't really see that uh, there is any real business risk to this ongoing problem. Uh, maybe they feel it's already been priced in and it's time to, you know, really buy back into the stock. But you're right. Uh, they're shrugging it off and really moving on and looking back at the core business of Samsung. Have you been looking into, there are some reports coming from VentureBeat that maybe that we'd see a delay in the Galaxy S8 and S8 Plus. Is that something that we should read in that is coming from concern and issues at the very top or do they keep these businesses all quite distinct? Look, I would be guessing that really if there was any delay, it wouldn't be anything to do with the, the drama uh, going on at the top and in the prosecutor's office. It would be a product thing. You know, uh, despite what I was just saying about, you know, the strategic offices that are important, the company, uh, you know, divisions like the smartphone division run pretty autonomously in many ways. They do what they need to do. They've got great engineers, salespeople, distribution people to get a product out. And so probably, if anything, it would be an abundance of caution to make sure they have, don't have any technical problems like they did with the Galaxy. Uh, S7 note, uh, that'd be more likely than any problems uh, they, they've got in the legal sphere. And Tim, I'm going to dive into another key area of your expertise while I've got you on because interestingly we're looking over in Asia of the potential sale of Toshiba's memory chip unit and many had felt that this was really the jewel in their crown but you've been writing that actually it might be the right time to get rid of this. Yeah, exactly. You know, I'm one of the many people who, f who do feel that it is a jewel in the crown, given that they've got this, uh, this nuclear scandal that's going on that's really hurting their, their financials. They're going to have to take a loss on it. But in a gadfly column I wrote, uh, you know, in the last 24 hours, I do argue that the issue here for, for Toshiba and the chip business is we may be hitting peak memory. What they're doing is making memory chips, the most prevalent type of chips, but it's a very much a commodity chip. And what we're seeing now in China is there's a lot of new upstarts, competitors who are spending a lot of money to build capacity 
capacity, like incredible amounts of money. We're talking billions and billions of dollars over the next few years to build capacity. And in a commodity business like memory chips, when there's a lot of extra capacity, uh, you know, oversupply can lead to falling prices. And it becomes this vicious cycle of lower prices, making it very difficult to make profits. And in fact, ironically, one of the ways that you have to deal with that is churn out more chips just to create revenue to help cover the depreciation costs. And so really, there's a big risk to anyone in the memory industry over the next few years as all this new supply comes online in China in the next two to three, four years. And, you know, this may be a great time for Toshiba to get out of that business and to sell to somebody who wants to be in the business. Well, maybe Toshiba hoping that Foxconn and indeed some of the other potential buyers aren't reading your Gadfly column, but I urge everyone else who's viewing to do so. Tim Culpen in Hong Kong, thank you very much indeed. Now, on today's funding board, Jay-Z, a personal favourite, is adding to his repertoire. The rapper's entertainment company, Rock Nation, is launching a startup platform called Arrive. The fund will focus on investments in early-stage startups as well as advise the companies on branding and business. Jay-Z, whose name is also Sean Carter, has long been interested in the tech scene, having invested in, reportedly, Uber, high-tech luggage maker Away, and private jet startup Jet Smarter. Carter is also the co-owner of the music streaming service Tidal. Now tomorrow on Bloomberg Television, former Bank of England Governor Mervyn King joins as a guest host on Surveillance. Don't miss that conversation starting at 6am New York time, 11am in London. Now coming up on Bloomberg Technology, the fake news saga continues and it's now Google's featured snippets that are under fire. We'll explain. This is Bloomberg. The fake news saga continues. Google under fire as its featured snippets appear to be flawed. It comes at a time when the search giant continues to attempt to expand from a source of links to a source of answers. So, does the tech giant need to do a crackdown on the problem? Joining us now from Newport Beach, California, Danny Sullivan, the founder of Search Engine Land. Danny, thank you for joining us. And we saw this engulf Facebook in many a way. They were scrutinized for fake news surrounding the election. How does this compare for Google? Is it worse, better, the same and different? It's a bit different in that you don't get the viral component to it. Something doesn't quickly spread across Google uh, in the way that it'll spread across Facebook. But it still has important repercussions because you'll have people who will turn to Google to try to understand if something's true. And they do a search and they get one of these answers to tell them, yes, Obama is planning a coup or yes, Republicans are Nazis. Um, some of them might come away with their, their preconceptions reinforced. I mean, they really are quite shocking, some of the boxed answers, it would seem, that they, that they shine a light on. And, and the ner unnervingness element to all of this, as we'll see Barack Obama being claimed to be the king of the United States, that's not so <laughs> worrying. But when it does involve some of the more extreme elements, it, it seems to give it vindication and some sort of level of truth. How does Google go about fixing this? It'll be a challenge for them because, you know, in any given day, they're handling around 5 billion queries. They might be doing something upwards to 750 million of these featured answers along those lines. And uh, you can't human vet any of those sorts of things. It's possible that they'll try to improve the algorithm to get more authoritative sites. Uh, but even then, if you take uh, in one example I had uh, coming from Slate, when you would ask if Donald Trump was paranoid, it came back and Google did as a featured answer that he was paranoid and mentally ill. And while many people might want to agree with that, it wasn't coming from a medical doctor, but it was coming from a respected publication and being featured that way. So it's, it's a challenge to figure out how do you come up with good, helpful answers and yet not put these specialized boxes around things that are controversial or in question. I'm just talking of Donald Trump. Are you expecting him in some way to weigh in on this? Should we? Will, will Alphabet be bracing themselves? <laughs> Um, well, you never seem to know what Donald Trump may do. Um, I would expect that if some publication found one of these things and didn't like it, they might write about it and then he might read about it at 4 a.m. and do a tweet. Um, he's been critical of Google before in the past when he saw people were writing that they were skewing their search suggestions uh, somehow to favor uh, Hillary Clinton. That wasn't actually the case, but he certainly believed it and gave criticism to him, and I'm sure he'd be happy to criticize him again. 
I mean, it's, with search engine land, is this something that, of course, fake news was levelled at YouTube element of Alphabet, but how widespread are we starting to see the internet companies fight back against fake news, and do you think the steps they've taken have been enough? Well, I think... You know, Google has taken some steps in terms of trying to curtail advertising. Uh, there's some question about whether or not they need to do more and if what people believe was going to be pulled back on fake news really was fake news. I think the bigger challenge that we're facing here is that the Internet is full of lies, half-truths, and misconceptions. And despite all of Google's machine learning and algorithms that are out there, it's very difficult to know what's the truth, especially when you get into controversial things. And so, you know, they may have to revisit the best way that they present stuff. In the past, we were largely protected because you'd get 10 different results yeah. and it left you to the human to be critical. But when you have a voice spoken device like Google Home that gives you one answer, uh, much more difficult. Danny Sullivan, founding editor of Search Engine Land. Thank you very much for joining us. And great little bridge that you have on the back on the left of your screen. Thank you. Thank you. And in this edition of the Out of This World, Blue Origin is expected to give an update this week on its long-term goal of building rockets powerful enough for deep space travel. Now remember, this is a space transport company founded by Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos. According to the Wall Street Journal, the company will announce some customers and new initiatives for launch operations. Bezos is slated to speak Tuesday at an international satellite conference in Washington. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Remember, you can always follow us live streaming on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.